Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. This is part three in the four-part series on the Great Leap Forward. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the famine that occurred as a result of the Great Leap policies that we've been discussing in the past two episodes. There's a lot written about the causes of the famine, which factors had the most impact on its severity, regional variances in population mortality, and the total number of lives lost during the course of the period. However, I'm going to throw all of the more academic, debatey, technical stuff into the next episode. Today I want to focus more on the human side of the famine, what it looked like on the ground, and also look at some of the stories of suffering that took place during this period. I believe all of the stories that I'll mention were based in the countryside, but I will talk about how the famine affected urban areas generally as well. We also need to cover how the news of the famine was brought to light in the leadership and cover the reversal of Great Leap policies by the central government, so there's quite a bit to get through in this one. For the personal anecdotes of what happened during the Great Famine, as it's generally known, I'll be relying on interviews with survivors, which have been transcribed in books and articles, as well as a couple of personal stories that have been authored by survivors themselves. One of these books in particular stands out to me as something that I would always recommend people to read if they want to know more about 20th century China from a more personal perspective. It's a book called Song of Praise for a Flower. It's a very touching personal memoir of a woman named Feng Xian, who was born in the 1920s and who lived through pretty much every major event that we discuss in this podcast. In fact, she's still alive today. As someone who lived in the countryside and who went through that whole process of being a rich peasant to someone of a bad class background, it gives a lot of good detail into the processes of change from traditional China to communist China, as well as highlighting things that didn't really change much at all. If you ever really want to feel bad about complaining about the mundane inconveniences in your life, and possibly cry more than once, I definitely recommend it. So, let's start from the unfolding of the famine across the country from around the end of 1958. Just so you're aware, there have been some differences in opinion as to the exact dates of the famine, whether it started in 1958 or 59, and whether it ended in 1961 or 62. This is because while the tragedy as a whole was national in nature, the scale and impact of the famine was local to the extent that neighbouring counties could have drastically different death tolls. It's known that the famine began earlier in Sichuan province than elsewhere, for example. So for the purposes of this episode, and the next one, we'll say that the problem began at the end of 1958, when the final harvest of that year was found to be lacking, and ended during the course of 1962, when the government's policies to reverse the leap were able to come into full effect. It's now broadly accepted that the famine was caused due to the collision of a number of different factors. Generally speaking, there are five main reasons as to why the famine took place. The first is the diversion of labour away from agriculture into large-scale projects, such as dam building. The second is poor weather conditions and natural disasters, including droughts and floods. The third is the promotion of faulty science, including encouraging dense planting of crops, double rice cropping in regions that didn't really allow for it attempting to grow wheat on land previously used to store water during the winter, and the Four Pests campaign, which led to an increase in the number of insects due to the depletion of their natural predators. The fourth reason is mismanagement by provincial governments and the radicalism of local cadres and provincial leaders, and the fifth reason is central government policies, especially over-procurement encouraged by the over-reporting of grain production. Of course, some of these factors overlap with one another. For example, the extent of over-reporting often depended on how zealous local cadres were, with more independent-thinking cadres taking measures to actually preempt the famine and preserve grain, which we'll talk about a bit later. The amount of labour to be diverted away from farming was also usually a local choice. Cadres could choose to send either some or most of their good workers away to build dams and backyard steel furnaces, which in the end contributed to how many hands were missing when it came to planting and harvesting. The official stance of the Chinese government during the Maoist era was that the disaster was seven-tenths natural and three-tenths man-made. We'll talk about the debates over which of these factors is considered to have been the most influential in the next episode 
But for now, it's safe to say that all of these factors in some way contributed to the worsening of the famine in some areas at some point. When it comes to different parts of the country that were worst hit by the famine, this again varies for a number of reasons. I mentioned in the last episode the question of topology and China's varying climates, but other things to take into consideration are population density, arable farmland availability, proximity to major urban areas, and to what extent that area was considered to be a major supply region or breadbasket for other areas of the country. The worst hit provinces overall were Anhui, Henan, Sichuan, Gansu and Guizhou, whereas certain provinces got off a bit lighter, such as Shanxi and Zhejiang, though they still suffered increased death rates. People in the countryside generally began to realise something was wrong when the communal dining halls started to run out of food, and food substitutes were introduced in many places. The lack of nutrition in these substitutes, along with the lack of food available in general, led to health problems that were usually the cause of death. Many people were resigned to scouring the countryside for wild food to eat. This included insects, bark from certain trees, and wild grasses. Here's one account from a woman who lived in Anhui province at the time. Quote, The communal canteen did not serve proper food, just wild grasses, peanut shells, and sweet potato skins. Because of this diet, we had terrible problems. Some people were constipated, but others had diarrhoea and could not go beyond their front doors. All the trees in the village had been cut down. Any nearby was stripped of bark. I peeled off the bark of a locust tree and cooked it as if it were rice soup. It tasted like wood and was sticky. At the time, the villagers looked quite fat and even healthy because they were swollen, but when they were queuing up at the canteen to eat, they would suddenly collapse and could not get back up. In his retelling of his youth growing up in a small village, Professor Mobo Gao gives some insight into how the famine proceeded in rural Jiangxi province and how personal problems could exacerbate the suffering felt by individuals. In his book, Gao Village, Rural Life in Modern China, he tells the story of one of his neighbours who, already suffering before the famine, was driven to suicide by the cruel treatment of her family. Quote, The woman who hanged herself was one of my next-door neighbours. There were always quarrels in that family, particularly between that woman and her mother-in-law. In 1960, Life was getting extremely difficult, and the mother-in-law kept insisting that the younger woman eat the least and worst food in the family. The mother-in-law forced the woman to eat tree bark and a type of edible soil called Boritsava earth, until eventually the latter could bear it no longer. She hung herself in the family toilet. However, apart from this one death, Gao notes that there were no other deaths in his village or the surrounding villages during the famine years that he knew of. He even notes that the communal dining halls only prepared rice, and the majority of villagers cooked most of their dishes at home, unlike we saw in other parts of the country where the dining halls were people's main source of nutrition during the entire Great Leap period. While the rice got thinner and more watery as the leap went on, the canteens were at least still able to serve real food until the end of the leap. This could partially be attributed to the fact that Jiangxi province in general suffered relatively few deaths as a result of the famine, approximately 1% of its population, compared to, say, neighbouring Anhui province, which had around 6 million excess deaths or 18% of its population die during the Great Leap period. In the well-known anthology of studies on the Great Leap Forward, entitled Eating Bitterness, Chen Yixin's study attributes the differences between Anhui and Jiangxi provinces, many of whose villages are separated by only a few kilometres, to three main factors. The first is growing conditions. Anhui's population was around 50% more than that of Jiangxi's, and Jiangxi had more land available for agriculture, with better quality soil and a more reliable water supply. A typical Jiangxi farmer could get around twice as much yield from the same size of land as a typical Anhui farmer. The second factor was the in-kind tax, or grain requisition by the state. Cadres in both Anhui and Jiangxi were guilty of exaggerating grain output, but while this led to so much food being taken away from Anhui that there wasn't enough left to feed the peasants, in Jiangxi, cadres earmarked grain for the peasants first before releasing the rest to the state. 
and Hui also transferred more labour away from agriculture to large-scale projects, around 44% of its total labour force, meaning that grain output was even worse than in previous years, let alone falling short of the exaggerated predictions. Finally, there was quite a big difference in provincial leadership. Anhui's primary leader, Zhang Xisheng, was a zealous Mao supporter and avid promoter of the Great Leap Forward. He was also dictatorial, had few local ties, and tended to dismiss people who disagreed with him. In contrast, the leaders of Jiangxi were not only natives of peasant origin and actively took complaints and criticism from locals and adjusted policies accordingly, they were also Mao loyalists, it's just that they weren't as radical in their implementation of policies and tended to be more realistic. The results of these two situations had drastic consequences. During the famine, around half a million famine refugees fled Anhui for Jiangxi, and despite this, Jiangxi was still in no real danger, even during the height of the famine. This study shows us that when under stress, the accumulation of a number of seemingly small and unrelated differences could make a huge impact on the outcome for the population. Other provinces with extra space, resources, or ways out also managed to avoid the majority of fatalities during the famine. Heilongjiang province, for example, underwent a land reclamation drive during the Great Leap, with 100,000 soldiers used to free up around 42,000 square kilometres of land. This new agricultural land not only offset the effects of the leap, but also turned Heilongjiang into a major national food supplier. In the book Song of Praise, Feng Shen notes how even though the people were reduced to eating wild foods, this was in relative abundance due to the fertility of the region, and the number of deaths was partially reduced due to the region's tradition of double rice cropping. Feng Shen lived in Guangdong province, which also served as a sort of through road during this time, as many people fled the mainland for Hong Kong, including at one point one of her own children. As Anhui was one of the provinces that suffered the most during the famine, many of the stories of hardship and tragedy are sourced from there. The severity of the famine meant that entire families disappeared, sometimes entire villages, and in some cases people were driven to make extreme decisions that they would never normally consider. Returning to the story of the lady from Anhui earlier, she continues and says, quote, More than half of the villagers died, mostly between New Year 1960 and April or May of that year. In one of our neighbours' houses, three boys and a girl starved. Another family of 16 all died. Many families disappeared completely, with no survivors at all. The production team leader's daughter-in-law and grandson both starved to death. He then boiled and ate the corpse of the child, but then he also died. When the village teacher was on the verge of death, he said to his wife, Why should we keep our child? If we eat him, I can survive, and later we can have another one. His wife refused to do this, and her husband died. From 1960 onwards, food augmentation and substitute campaigns were introduced by the CCP to try and combat the worst of the famine. Methods included boiling, grinding, and steaming different staples to make them stretch, or increasing the volume of certain foods by combining several ingredients, in inverted commas. One technique was called creating Great Leap Buns, which were made by taking half-boiled rice, grinding it down, adding some yeast, and then steaming it until it was cooked. In places where stretching the food supplies wasn't quite enough, more inventive measures had to be implemented. The term food substitutes was just supposed to refer to non-grain staples that were now to make up the majority of people's diets, including wild food, tree bark, insects, and synthetic food made from bacteria cultures. In reality, food could eventually become anything that was deemed edible, as one story from a prisoner shows. Quote, the signal that truly desperate times were upon us came in early December when a horse-drawn cart entered the compound and prisoners began unloading the cargo, a dark brown sheet of unknown material, rigid and light, each measuring about three by five feet. The stuff was paper pulp, and we were going to eat it. A question that people often have when it comes to the Great Leap Famine is how so many people could be suffering and starving, and yet there was no recognition that there was a national crisis, either at the time or after the famine, 
and there was no national movement by people to demand a solution to the crisis. To answer this question, it's important that we look at the circumstances of China at the time. One of the most important things to remember about China is that communications infrastructure was still extremely basic, and most of it had been nationalised, meaning that the CCP controlled newspaper publications and radio broadcasts, which would have been the main ways of disseminating information. As it was, those official publications chose to be very selective in the way they presented information about disaster-struck regions. This extract written about Hubei province in October 1959 shows exactly how the official party organs could spin information in order to avoid outlining the worst of the catastrophe and still even manage to squeeze in a little bit of propaganda promotion for the leap in doing so. Quote, For 90 days from the end of June, no rains came and 50 million mu, of the province's total 62 million, suffered from severe drought. Thanks to strong leadership from the Communist Party, as soon as the first signs of drought appeared, 7 million people were mobilised to fight it. 140,000 cadres left their offices to carry water to the fields. Ignoring the scorching sun, they dug canals, ponds and wells, and brought water by every ways and means, sometimes literally drop by drop, to the thirsty plants. In the early days of September, the ponds were empty, rivers became dry, and fatigue was taking over most of the drought fighters. They transported water away from the faraway Yangtze River and other lakes. As a result, they reaped a great harvest of early rice and managed to save the crops of semi-late rice and cotton. In addition, they succeeded in planting the second crop of late rice and drought-resistant crops of over 3 million mu. Even if the party had chosen to share news of the disaster in their official publications, it's not necessarily the case that the news would even have reached every part of the country, or that people would have necessarily believed what was happening, considering how the extent of the famine ranged so widely from place to place. As it stood, at the time, people didn't even know what was going on a few villages over. One particular passage has always stood out to me as a perfect illustration of the widespread enforced ignorance of the Chinese peasants during the Great Leap Forward. It's the preface of a book called Tombstone, by author Yang Jisheng. It's a book about the famine, based almost entirely on survivors' accounts, but one of the most interesting accounts is that of the author himself. In his story, he tells about his father's death, how, in April of 1959, he travelled home from school upon hearing that his father was starving, bringing his own school ration to help sustain him. When he got to his village, he found it completely changed. No animals or children running around, no food or water, and his father lying withering away in his bed. Though he tried to nurse his father back to health, he eventually passed away three days later. The story itself is heartbreaking, but... Probably the most interesting part is his memory of how he processed his father's death, especially in light of local politics. Quote, I grieved deeply over my father's death, but never thought to blame the government. I didn't see that the government or the three red banners were involved in any way. I still harboured no doubts regarding the party's propaganda about the accomplishments of the Great Leap or the advantages of the people's communes. I had no idea what was going on farther away. I believed that what was happening in my home village was isolated, and that my father's death was merely one family's tragedy. Compared with the advent of the great communist society, what was my family's petty misfortune? The party had taught me to sacrifice the self for the greater good when encountering difficulty, and I was completely obedient. I maintained this frame of mind right up until the Cultural Revolution. At that time, I felt no suspicion and only complete acceptance of the things instilled in me by the Communist Party. Although I was very sad about my father's death, it did not weaken my confidence in the Chinese Communist Party. At that time, many young people who enthusiastically participated in the leap were suffering from hunger along with their family members, but they never complained. Like me, they were completely sincere. Communism inspired them, and many among them would gladly have sacrificed their lives for this great ideal. My heartfelt support for the Great Leap Forward was due not only to inspiration of communist ideals, but also to ignorance. I came from a remote village, far from any major thoroughfare. We were largely closed off from information, and residents of our village knew virtually nothing about matters beyond the hills. They did not know of the great event that occurred in Beijing on the 1st of October 1949. 
the village cadre, Huang, knew, and he held a meeting in the village on that day. The next day, his son told me, Chairman Mao has been enthroned. I asked, what do you mean? He replied, he's the emperor. He said that this is what his father had told him. The vast majority of us never circulated beyond a 50 kilometer radius of the village. This striking account of a young boy living out his youth in a remote village probably reflects the majority of experiences of peasants during this period since 1949. To Yang, there was no great famine, no national catastrophe, no leftist wind that had led the people to their doom. There were only local people and local problems, and the Chinese Communist Party. In the book Song of Praise for a Flower, the author describes herself and her fellow average countrymen as frogs in a well. This famous Chinese proverb comes from the story of a frog that had lived its entire life at the bottom of a cold, dark well, with only a small ring of light at the top to indicate that the outside world existed. One day, a passing bird flew down and offered to bring the frog up to the light so it could enjoy everything the world had to offer. But the frog just laughed at the bird and refused thinking that the world that they lived in was the entire world. Feng Xian says that the people of China at the time were just like this frog at the bottom of the well. They had no knowledge of anything outside of the well, and only had the party delivering messages like the sun shining down through the top of the well to let them know what was happening in the outside world. They were people of no knowledge or experience, and their entire lives were limited to planting in the fields in front of them and following one party directive after the other. From this perspective, it's easy to see how the whole Chinese population was able to be led from one disastrous scheme, like the Great Leap Forward, almost immediately into the Cultural Revolution, which proved to be just as disruptive, ideologically tortuous, and for many, much more violent. Apart from concealing the truth from their own population, the CCP also managed to conceal the truth at an international level, at least for some time. In 1960, former Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, father of current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, visited China for six weeks and was given a tour of the country, displaying the results of the Great Leap Forward. In his travel diary, the nature and extent of the famine was heavily played down. Quote, Isn't famine raging in China at this very moment? You mean the famine in which the conservative press of the West takes such delight? It's true that dispatches from Hong Kong report, quote, a shortage of provisions that in some districts verges on famine, and it's true that during our journey, people mentioned to us droughts in the south and floods in the north. All the same, it has to be acknowledged, it would take more than that to overthrow the government of Mao. In fact, famine today would do less harm than in the past, for there would be no financial sharks to speculate in the misery, and the instruments of distribution are better organised than they used to be. In conclusion, the Chinese will continue to listen to the teachers of Marxism at their weekly meeting. Despite some people trying to blow the whistle on the true situation in China at the time, the true extent of the famine would not be known to the Western world until several years later, when archives opened up between the 1970s and 1980s. Even then, it would take many years before former deniers would come around, and it became generally acknowledged that something had gone horribly wrong. For the most staunch believers in communism, it took a while for them to believe that there were more than just a few hard years for China's peasants. But not everybody just gave in to the disaster or caved to central pressure to inflate production values and increase grain procurement. More recent scholarship has revealed several instances of local resistance to central policies, as well as documenting the quick-thinking ways that local peasants, cadres and officials avoided the worst of the calamity. A form of basic resistance included eating green crops, in other words, eating unripened crops in the field before they were harvested and collected by the state. There were also cadres who concealed production quotas and continued to engage in private distribution of grain during the leap. Theft, in the form of nicking from a pile or just taking a handful of food before it went to the state granaries, also became a widespread practice in many areas, with cadres turning a blind eye to the actions of their fellow peasants. Far from passively accepting the dictates of the state, research that engages with survivors of the famine reveals the many everyday techniques that peasants use to escape from the worst of the disaster. 
These moves against the state not only ensured peasant survival, but also ensured the rapid undoing of collectivization after the Great Leap. Unfortunately, reports of these instances of smart, resilient, or courageous peasants and cadres are relatively few and far between. The majority of the country was so swept up by the so-called leftist winds, and so resistant to so-called rightist thinking promoted by experts, that any sort of resistance to central policy was unthinkable to begin with. The enacting of national policies, often with great enthusiasm by local cadres, meant that local people had no choice but to suffer the consequences, regardless of how resourceful they may have tried to be. Well, so much for the famine in China's villages. Let's look a little bit at how the famine affected China's urban areas. As I mentioned in the previous episode, there was a huge difference in how the leap was rolled out in urban areas versus rural areas, and this difference extended all the way down to how the two areas were affected by food shortages in terms of death rates and sociological changes. As the disaster worsened throughout late 1958, and particularly through 1959, the disparity between urban and rural became even starker. While many in the cities suffered from food shortages, the actual famine was almost entirely a rural affliction. The food imbalance between city and countryside can largely be attributed to the nature of the leap itself. Because heavy industry was prioritised above and at the expense of other sectors, including agriculture, many workers were relocated from the countryside to cities in order to form the new workforce. Urban factories scrambled to hire rural workers, many of whom moved to the city despite the introduction of the household registration system, or huko, just a few years earlier. Though this huko was supposed to limit rural-urban migration, most rural migrants managed to secure temporary employment in suburban workshops, doing manual labour such as cement making. Though they were excluded from the better-paying jobs in the city centre, and had to live without the security of a permanent urban huko, the higher wages and higher standards of living alone made it worth the uncertain prospects. However, an influx of hundreds and thousands of rural migrants to the city caused a strain on resource flows. This meant that there was both a lack of agricultural workers to maintain crop production levels, as well as a huge surplus of city dwellers relying on state-subsidised grain, which was given priority over peasant consumption. Not only did the emphasis on industrialization exacerbate the effects of the leap in the countryside, it essentially caused the rural famine and urban food shortages in the first place. City dwellers were not entirely unaware of the suffering that was going on in the countryside. In 1959, upon hearing of the abundance of food in the city, 180 peasants from a village outside of Tianjin took to their carts to travel to the city and beg for food. Their suspicions were correct. There was more food in the city, and the beggars that suddenly appeared on the streets were often the urban residents' first sign that there was something wrong. Many city dwellers, having recently moved from the countryside themselves, also had plenty of families still living in villages, some of whom came to live with them during the latter years of the leap in order to stay fed. Top city officials were aware of the tragedy occurring in the countryside as they received reports from other districts, but they were unable to offer any help due to the multiple layers of bureaucracy that meant that decisions were made by specific committees, such as the Grain Bureau, as opposed to local officials. Those in charge of the cities had no choice but to concentrate on looking after their own. The central leadership also worked harder to keep cities fed and protect urban residents from the worst of the disaster, lest industrial production collapse entirely and the whole country be thrown into financial ruin. Despite these efforts, cities still ended up with food shortages, grain rations were cut, and many urban residents suffered from malnutrition and edema. Some tried to cope by pickling vegetable parts that they would have otherwise just thrown away, or by watering down their meals, but others were not so happy to suffer in silence. Some workers staged sit-ins, hounded local officials, or even resorted to trying to counterfeit government-issued ration tickets to get around the allowance cuts. Crime in general increased, especially theft. Incidences ranged from petty but cruel examples of nursery workers stealing from the rations of the children they were supposed to be looking after, to armed robbers killing people for tiny bits of grain or cash. Black markets also sprang up in urban areas, 
especially those that could rely on supplies from villages that were not so affected by the famine, or who had outright refused to hand grain over to the state, and were weathering the storm fairly well. The growth in these markets was exacerbated by the downsizing of the number of full-time urban workers, as Financial Minister Chen Yun had ordered a reduction in the number of urban residents by 20 million between 1961 and 1963. While some of these workers were happy to return to their families in the villages, excited for the prospect of being able to farm their own private plots again, others found ingenious ways to avoid leaving the cities, including setting up shop. In Tianjin in 1962, a quarter of all pork and half of the fruit sold were sold in black markets, which had actually become legal markets as of July of that year. Those who ran these markets could earn between five to ten times more than the average state worker. As knowledge spread of the scale of the disaster in the countryside, instances of people trying to smuggle food out of the cities also became more commonplace. City officials had to set up checkpoints in major entry points in order to curb the outflow of grain from cities. In Tianjin, for example, over 1,800 cases of food smuggling were discovered in just one day, as people tried ingenious ways to conceal the food, for example in coffins, or by strapping it to women's bellies to pretend that they were pregnant. So this is what the Great Leap Famine looked like in the countryside and in cities. How then was the leap and the resulting suffering brought to an end? While people were still starving into 1962, it seems that attempts to call off the leap and curb the worst of the resulting food shortages began a couple of years earlier in 1960. At a conference of top leadership called in July 1960 to figure out exactly how to deal with the disaster that was folding across the country, the first thing that the party did was dismantle the framework of the Great Leap. Agriculture was to be prioritised as the base of China's economy, and a new emergency policy, known as the 12 Articles on People's Communes, was issued that called for decentralisation within communes and allowed a reintroduction of material incentives in exchange for work. Apart from that, the central government didn't really focus its energy on coming up with ways to boost grain production, instead allowing local leaders to implement whatever policies they felt necessary to get the country back up and running again. The main change was the official disbandment of the communal dining hall system in 1960, with no actual policy on boosting production. Peasants and local cadres were left to find out how to conserve food on their own, and were left to deal with the next year's harvest. Instead, the leadership led by the planners group that I mentioned in episode one of this series, concentrated their efforts on launching an investigation into the leap and drafting policies to help manage and develop China's future from all angles, including the economy, industry, agriculture, education, trade and population growth. These new policies were drafted with extreme care, with party leaders led by Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi actually employing the help of experts to determine what had gone wrong by visiting certain areas and carrying out specific investigations. The results of these investigations were then used to draft new policies. These policies deliberately undermined certain key aspects of the Great Leap Movement, for example, discarding the idea that China could be entirely self-reliant by pointing out the need for greater imports of certain materials to help develop industry or by reintroducing private plots to the countryside and allowing families to manage their own produce and profits once again. Experts were no longer a pariah, and the idea of political mobilisation was almost completely done away with, much to Mao's disappointment. In fact, although Mao was sitting quietly, watching others work around him, and forced to sit in the sidelines after everyone decided that he didn't know anything about economics, he was secretly fuming at the way in which the legacy of the Great Leap was being treated. Although Mao admitted that political mobilisation could not produce major leaps in economic progress and material output, and he even actually wrote a self-criticism to that effect in 1961, he was still not happy at all with the idea of political movements being discarded altogether. This, he felt, was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. To make matters worse, the leadership also disagreed as to what the causes of the disastrous leap were. While Liu Xiaoqi argued that the crisis was 70% due to bad political decisions, 
and 30% due to the withdrawal of Soviet aid, Mao felt that the opposite was true. Despite the fact that many senior-level cadres and government officials felt that Mao's directives were to blame for the famine, no one was actually willing to openly accuse or criticise him in public meetings. It didn't help that Mao had the army on his side, with the leader of the PLA, Lin Biao, actively promoting Mao Zedong thought amongst his ranks, preventing any real undermining of Mao's position. Because of this strong ideological position, it took years for the planners to actually achieve the policy changes they were looking for to get China back on track. Compulsory grain procurement by the state was cut back around 50%. The government introduced higher payments for grain sold willingly by peasants and also allowed them to exchange grain for commodities, which were in short supply in the countryside. In 1961, 750 grams of grain could buy 15 feet of cotton, one pair of rubber shoes, 20 feet of knitted goods, 1.5 kilograms of sugar, two cases of cigarettes and 400 grams of cotton for padding in quilts and jackets. Not a bad trade. Small private family plots were introduced, as were private grain markets. Decision making was taken away from the commune and instead given to the smallest operational unit, the brigade, whose size was on average 20 to 30 families. Emphasis was also changed from production of crops for industry, such as cotton and oil-producing crops, to cereals. In some areas, these policies led to the complete collapse of collective farming, which was arguably not a bad thing. In industry, the planners drastically cut back the rates of investment as well as production targets for major industrial goods. Tens of thousands of factories, workshops and enterprises were closed, and around 30 million urban migrants relocated back to the countryside. By reducing the wage bill, as well as the number of people relying on the state for food rations, the budget was able to produce a surplus in the years following 1962. The road to economic recovery was slow and steady, taking till around 1965 to complete. However, by 1962, Mao was already working on a way to regain dominance within the party, especially the planning structure, which for him always meant focusing on the revolution over silly, pragmatic policies. The lessons learnt by those in charge of the Great Leap were quickly undone by a new wave of zealotry from 1965 onwards. The reintroduction of class struggle and the undoing of the trend towards marketization of agriculture was the final nail in the coffin for the potential of China's economic growth until after the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976, and the country was able to then reopen to the world. But it's a while before we will get to the Cultural Revolution. We still have one more episode on the Great Leap, and that is it for this episode. So for the next and final episode covering the Great Leap Forward, we'll be talking about the academic questions surrounding the famine. You probably noticed that I didn't mention any figures when talking about deaths, and I kind of avoided going into too much detail about the actual causes of the famine. These areas will all be covered in the next episode, as well as how debates over these issues have developed since the opening up of archives and expansion of interest in the Great Leap Forward has grown since the 1980s. Don't forget that you can sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter by going to Substack and searching for Sinobabble, or you can sign up on the website. Also feel free to donate to the podcast if you wish by going to the website and clicking on the donate button. You can choose to give either a single amount or sign up for a monthly subscription of an amount of your choice. Every and any donation is greatly appreciated. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and I hope you tune in next time. 